Welcome back from that one. I am now being joined by the Director General of the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, Man Shegun Ajayi Kade. Many thanks for joining us on Business Insights, uh, Mr. Ajayi Kade. Thank you for having me. It is indeed our pleasure. Let's just dive straight into it. Uh, tell us about the impact on this higher electricity tariff vis-a-vis -vis the cost of productions for manufacturers. Yes, I think to start is to place it within the context. Uh, manufacturers, like most Nigerians, rely on electricity to do business. For us in the manufacturing sector, uh, the electricity is like uh, the blood is to the body. You require it for all your operations, be it on the factory floor, or in the offices. And that explains why, like you rightly mentioned, in the year 2022, manufacturers had to spend 144 billion naira to provide alternative source of electricity because the national grid was not uh, sufficient, was not offering sufficient uh, supply of power. So what we have seen uh, with this anticipated or imminent increase in electricity tariff is anxiety. Mm. A 40% increase in electricity tariff will be clearly unbearable for the sector. Having seen that we enjoy only between six to 12 hours of electricity, and also seeing that the cost of providing alternative uh, energy has constituted a toll on manufacturing competitiveness, our profitability, and our capacity utilization. Manufacturers are now very anxious as to how the year will end, having seen that in the early part of the year, we have had the currency transition making us to record unprecedented low sales, we have seen that how the removal of fuel subsidy in recent times has led to a reduction in purchases due to low uh, uh, disposable income of the average Nigerian. We have seen how the unification of the uh, uh, forex rate uh, has uh, meant that our cost of production will rise. Even though some of, most of these policies of the new administration are positive and the thing to do, they had led to our re-strategizing and repositioning our operations in order to be able to weather the storm. What we are not expecting is this hike, particularly because it is not based on any assurance or any indication or any anticipation of improved services. It will appear that in all this conversation, what is being put on the table is just the hike and not how we are going to witness improved services. Okay, that is actually a very uh, sad tale if you ask me. But let's talk more about uh, the impact really on manufacturing vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, if we compare ourselves uh, to the world. In your latest uh, release, uh, you noted that the unfavorable situation, that's um, the power issue, has positioned the country among the worst countries to do business. Tell us more about that and um, where do we stand on that list, really? Competitiveness is the key in all manufacturing efforts because once a manufacturer produces, he is interested in selling because you have no business uh, manufacturing if only you are going to keep it on the shelf. And so when you compare yourself with countries, and that is basically what determines the ease of doing business, when you compare yourself with the countries that produce similar products that come into your country to compete, or you aspire to compete with in their own market through export, how you, price, how you stand in terms of price, essentially, will determine your competitiveness. So in the ease of doing business and in choosing where to do business around the world, what you look at is how favorable that economy is, how welcoming 
that economy is. Alaji Ali Kodangote was credited to have said in Accra that we were just last week that he wouldn't go to invest in a country that makes life difficult for him. That's essentially uh, uh, what we have. And our ranking has uh, placed us in the rock bottom of, uh, uh, of the pyramid, where you have nations that have not paid adequate attention to reducing the cost of doing business and ensuring that it makes a place a welcoming place for capital to, 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 to flow. Some people have said that capital is very shy and is a coward. It will not go to a place where it will not be able to freely operate, where it will not be able to produce at competitive rates, and where it cannot predict what policies are going to govern the operating environment. That is the scenario that uh, we have found ourselves. And we are saying that we should not compound it by increasing those pain points that have led us to rank in those categories. All right. Uh, staying with the, with the last uh, release uh, from um, MAN, that is, uh, manufacturers are expecting the federal government and uh, the regulator that is a neck to ensure improvement in electricity generation, transmission, and distribution, rather than increasing the tariff on the mere 4,000 um, megawatts. Okay, what do you think really can be done differently from the generation stage to eventual distribution? Okay, you know, the power sector reform has actually laid down a lot of uh, processes that should allow us to have a seamless uh, operation along the value chain. What we have always had is that we do not have so much problem with generation and transmission, that what we have is with distribution. At some other times, we have been informed about how inadequate our infrastructure has been to support the transmission. So government over the years has invested heavily in the first two stages, that's the generation and the transmission. Then we had again that in terms of, uh, of distributing the power, that the discos have lacked the capacity. Probably the, uh, the, I do not want to say the competence, but maybe the capacity to effectively distribute. Mm. At a time, we were able to generate 7,000 megawatts, but the discos were only able to wheel 5,000. Now I believe we are down to 4,000. So efficiency in the value chain is key. But more importantly is the ones that you have been able to generate, the ones that you have been able to transmit, you should be able to distribute. There is a lot of investment that uh, is required, especially between generation and transmission. And I believe that the government that plays heavily in that, uh, in that sector should be implored upon to allow flow of investment into that segment, such that we'll be able to generate enough. I mean, Nigeria, we are 200 million plus people, and we are generating only 7,000, we are distributing only 4,000. Mm -hmm. You put a place like South Africa, the population is not up to 50 million, but they generate more than 45,000 megawatts of electricity. I believe that if government is, uh, that uh, invests, should invest heavily and allow private sector to participate along the value chain. Happily, the newly signed Electricity uh, Act is going to uh, um, help us in that regard because it's going to allow more players to come in, okay. it's going to generate uh, a lot of competition, it's going to bring innovation into even uh, uh, other sources of, of power, and it's going to ensure that if you are inefficient, uh, you will see a, a, a rapid replacement. I believe this is what the, okay. uh, the value chain requires. Yeah. Because if you have a monopoly or operation, you are not likely to witness the kind of progress that you will have made. All right. Let's just talk about um, the new act, which you uh, have mentioned in passing. And of course, you have said uh, in um, previous um, uh, releases uh, that uh, it is a welcome 
development. And um, but my question right now is that, uh, is it Uhuru for the Nigerian and power situation with this new act? And uh, judging by the fact that um, power supply is uh, very capital intensive and uh, looking at uh, the, the economy of most um, states, uh, do you really think uh, that they can actually meet up with all of the demands now that power has um, been devolved, uh, so to speak? Well, uh, uh, if you are talking of the subnational, that's the states. Mm. Uh, I think, let's look at the states, for instance. Many of them have had to rely on the federal government for revenue. As a matter of fact, it's been said at some point that some states are not viable in the sense that they are not able to generate enough revenue to be able to meet their operations. Now you have huge population and almost everybody in Nigeria requires power. So if the states are smart, and they should be, power going into power, uh, into playing in the, in the power sector is going to give them a very huge opportunity to generate revenue internally. Because they will be able to augment whatever they get from the federal government, which has continued to dwindle uh, in view of the downward trend in uh, federal government uh, revenue if they are able to effectively partner with well-equipped, liquid, and experienced players in the power sector to establish power, uh, uh, to, 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 to engage in power generation and distribution as they've been empowered mm -hmm. by the new uh, law that everybody is applauding. So it will be a very good opportunity for them apart from ensuring that they are able to generate a, a lot of economic activities that will generally bring in uh, income in pay and in terms of other fees and levies and uh, uh, all sorts of fees that they collect, mm -hmm. it would, as a matter of fact, boost their economic development. It will boost even government operations and it will allow for inflow of uh, investment from all segments of the economy. So I, I believe that it is a huge opportunity for them. The only thing that they need to do is to be pragmatic and to focus on avoiding those challenges that we have seen mm -hmm. that has plagued gov federal government's incursion into, I mean, go federal government operation in that sector. Mm -hmm. uh, it should not be a license to bring in people that are not competent, it should not be a license to bring in people that do not have uh, capacity, but just because of political connections mm -hmm. and uh, uh, advantages that they are able to derive. I mean, this is power is capital intensive, like you said. So due diligence must be done to get people on board to support the states to do it. And it has also given opportunity for diverse uh, uh, investment in other non uh, I mean, sustainable means of generating power. Mm. Renewable energy is there. We have sun in abundance in most parts of the country. So uh, there's a huge opportunity for investment in those right. areas. I still want us to talk about the investment opportunities that uh, you have mentioned because uh, one would say that uh, uh, there, it brings uh, about um, a thing of um, the public-private uh, uh, participation in all of this, even as much as most states' uh, economy are not really well. I want to understand, really, maybe you can um, break it down for me, uh, where the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria can play in terms of um, the value chain. Uh, you also mentioned uh, renewable energy, maybe prepaid uh, metering and all of that. Where is man playing in all of this? Okay, so uh, MAN as an organization has always been concerned with uh, power supply to our members because I've indicated that uh, it's between 28% and 40% of the cost structure of an average manufacturing industry. So you will know that if we get it right in this area, we are likely to do well. True. So on our own, what we have done is to establish a special purpose vehicle that we call MAN Power Development Company which uh, basically interfaces with power uh, providers and make it available to our members in clusters and in uh, various industrial zones. So for us, the, the, the new uh, law will empower us to make rapid progress in this regard. 
It then means that we are able to partner with uh, uh, effective uh, power producers in our various industrial clusters so that we are able to have captive power that we will be able to deliver to our members. At the same time also, it's going to give us an opportunity for power sharing because we have industries that are big and they generate their own power, mm -hmm. but they are not able to share it with people within their vicinity. So I believe this will be a very good opportunity for us. It also opens room for us to directly engage those who can supply power and agree with them on how they will can do uh, what we maybe uh, something in the form of a bulk purchase or bulk mm -hmm. supply to existing manufacturers. What it what I think is critical uh, where we we are able to uh, play very well in this value chain is for us to be able to overcome the impediment that has continued to limit mm -hmm. private generation of power. I think that is the major issue because. For us, if we are able to get it right, it will tremendously increase our competitiveness. Right. So, I, and I think now there is a lot of conversation that is going on between our members and uh, us as to how we can best maximize the opportunities that have been offered uh, by the new law. All right, we want to say a very big thank you to you. Uh, Mr. Shego Ajayi Kaduri, Director General of the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, for spending time to break down all of the effect of the new um, proposed tariff and, of course, um, the new um, Electricity Act and how it will impact on manufacturers. We do appreciate your time, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. And that's the size of the show for today. But just before we go, I'll leave you with this issue of uh, brain drain, specifically in the medical uh, sector, medical tourism, how it has impacted on labor and, uh, you know, Nigerians' economy. Business Insight will return to your screen again tomorrow. My name is Justin Akadoni. Many thanks for watching. See you again next time. The Nigerian Medical Association says the country is now battling with its worst situation of brain drain as no fewer than 10,000 Nigerian trained doctors are currently practicing in the United Kingdom. To add to this dilemma, Nigerians seem to have a trust issue with getting medical services in the country. At this gathering, the focus is to provide an avenue for Nigerians to get world-class health care at affordable cost. Um, so that when we talk about the standard of healthcare in Lagos, we're talking about access we are, uh, to all spectra of the society from low to middle to higher uh, socio-economic groups and that we have put in place um, these kinds of standards uh, where we are talking about one standard of care. Today's um, prevailing economic climate, um, both in Nigeria and abroad, the idea that um, individuals can simply jet off abroad is becoming um, an increasingly um, unrealistic prospect. Uh, never mind um, the millions of the 200 million Nigerians who never had that option in the first place. So all of that, plus what happened over COVID, has forced us to look inwards. And, uh, and that's where the story of reversing medical tourism begin. Many Nigerians have lost confidence in the country's health system because of the poor service delivery. Some, however, believe the challenge can be solved from top bottom. The Vice President, Professor Yemio Shibajo, may have walked in that direction. However, the Lagos State Government says it is imperative to have a strategic initiative to make the city a medical tourism hub. We need to begin to think um, very carefully, very creatively, about how we ensure that we incentivize um, uh, doctors, healthcare professionals to stay in this country and to return to this country. We need to begin to think also about how we use our allied healthcare professional. And so our job in Lagos is to make sure that there's a standard of care across both private and public and that when people talk about healthcare delivery in Lagos that they speak with confidence, you know, that if I receive my treatment in Lagos, I know I'm going to get international best practices in that particular discipline. Interestingly, apart from lack of equipment and technical expertise, poor sanitation and disrespectful attitude of health workers and a perceived lack of confidentiality have been the sad narrative. This regardless, experts are confident that the tide is changing.